Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Lori Bambaco. I'm an oncology dietitian. I'm presenting to you from Cancer Wellness Center, and I'm running my favorite program that we offer here. I might be biased. Um, it's called Ask the Dietitian. That's me. And we pick a topic every month, and you get to decide what questions you want to ask related to that topic. And then I have 45 minutes to present my answers to your great questions. Um, every month that happens, people ask questions that are unrelated to the topic. And I really appreciate that, but I don't have the time to ex to offer any answers to those other questions that are not topic related. So what we decided to do is add in another program. And so we're going to have our first Ask the Dietitian Top 10 Most Commonly Asked Questions and we're going to have it on Monday, April 22nd. So please check the website, Cancer Wellness Center, and check the calendar and see if you'd like to register for that program. We also have a really fun program scheduled uh, coming up this Monday, April 8th, and it's a collaboration with myself and a local uh, smoothie bowl uh, restaurant, we're going to call them, um, and it's all about building nourishing smoothie bowls. And it's in person, which is very exciting. So hopefully we'll have much more opportunities similar to that one um, in the near future. So what I'm gonna do is share my screen and share my PowerPoint presentation. For those of you who registered, you will have a copy of this sent to you. And if you're joining us live on Facebook, thank you and welcome. So our topic for the month of April is all about nutrition and leveraging nutrition to support our energy levels and also reduce fatigue. So if you remember, if you were paying attention at the last Ask the Dietitian, I, I introduced this, this guy, Potato Pete. <laughs> and Potato Pete was part of a campaign in uh, the United Kingdom during World War II, and it was called Dig for Victory Campaign. And we had a similar campaign here in the States. It was called Victory Gardens. And the idea was that they were encouraging citizens to eat more healthfully and sparingly by growing their own. And potatoes just so happen to be a vegetable that's pretty easy to eat. But then also too is quite versatile and a bunch of different recipes and pretty nutri nutrient dense. But growing our own really helped to kind of conserve some of the resources that were being exhausted during the war effort. So this gentleman, Potato Pete, the way that he was advertised, this gentleman, <laughs> this lovely tuber, he was advertised as being an energy food. I thought that was very uh, special and appropriate for today's topic. So he was everywhere, right? He was on leaflets. They had him on the radio. They they even created this 11-page cookbook that you can access online. I found it. And this is the uh, the cover of that cookbook, cookbook, Potato Pete's Recipe Book. And this is just an excerpt from one of the recipes. And it's it was sort of like a section for all for breakfast dishes. And as you see, he's, he's suggesting, I give you pep to start the day. And I think like, who wouldn't want that? A little pep to start the day, right? So maybe you're interested in some of these recipes. I would encourage you to just check out Google and see what you might find. Um, but we certainly know that potatoes are a part of a healthy diet. And what we're going to talk more about is whether or not they or any other food gives us energy. That's what we're gonna explore today. So what I want to do is first start with an overview of cancer-related fatigue, or CRF. I'm going to list the questions that were submitted, provide the answers that I have as best as I can, and then offer some additional resources and some recipes that you might be interested in. So cancer-related fatigue, it's defined as a severe, I think that's the operative word there, a severe form of fatigue among people with cancer. It's overwhelming tiredness, exhaustion, and weakness that does not go away with adequate sleep or rest. So that's not the remedy, right? We don't just sleep and rest and all of a sudden the fatigue goes away. It still persists through that. The causes of cancer-related fatigue have been linked to anemia, pain, infection, trouble breathing, 
And then also too, the consequences of treatment and fatigue are that we might be less active and the diagnosis and the treatments for cancer might cause us to also lose some muscle mass and also our strength. And that could exacerbate and lead to cancer related fatigue. It can happen before, during, and even years after treatment. So this is a problem. And what percentage of people with cancer experience fatigue, would you guess? 80%. Pretty remarkable, right? So it's highly, highly prevalent. And it seems like it should be on all healthcare providers' radar to help our individuals who are diagnosed to help them manage cancer-related fatigue. And so that's why I thought it would be important to talk about that today. How can I help in my role here? So what are the treatments for cancer-related fatigue? Let's start first with another question, quiz question. It's an easier one, true or false? Food gives us energy. We may think it does, but not really. It's not like food is gonna make fatigue go away, right? We're looking into this and it's very early research and I can't wait to share what I know with you all today. But as it relates to managing cancer-related fatigue, it is a lifestyle approach. So we do want to embrace all of the elements that are important to helping to address fatigue. It starts with good sleep habits, whether it be sleeping through the night and having high quality sleep, the number of hours of sleep, all of that matters. Exercise and movement have been proven to be one of the best ways to manage cancer-related fatigue, food and drink. We're going to talk about that today. And then mind and body practices. So things like Qigong, Tai Chi, yoga, meditation, guided imagery, acupuncture, and even hypnosis. So if you're not familiar with any of those, again, I, I encourage you to check out the Cancer Wellness Center's website because we have some of those modalities that are um, either offer here or through referrals that we can give from here for you to explore. Um, and we have a lot of educational programs. So whether it be on our YouTube channel where you could learn more about these modalities or just continue to check out the calendar because this might be something very critical that you could add to your really lifestyle as it relates to cancer related fatigue, but also for wellness in general. All right, so let's get into those questions. That's why you're here, right? Uh, what, which food supports energy and reduces fatigue? That's like what we're here for, right? What are the best foods to boost energy and build muscle? What are the most nutritious foods to eat that are also low in calories to increase energy and increase stamina? What proteins provide the most energy and reduce fatigue? And how does limiting sugar intake re help reduce fatigue? A similar question is about cookies and sweets and how to... How do those increase fatigue? So I'll kind of lump all those together. Um, and then the next question, will eating a lot of extra protein help reduce fatigue? I'm seeing a pattern here. <laughs> what about keto breads? Some have six grams of protein and hardly any fat. So we're gonna talk more about that for a slide or two. Um, and then does eating dairy make you feel tired? I've stopped eating cereal with milk because I noticed that I got tired after eating breakfast. It made sense to me, because I woke up feeling fine, and after breakfast, I was tired. Is it that milk? Let's see if we can learn a little more about that. And then what if nothing works to reduce fatigue? I'd like to give you as best of an answer as I can for that one for you. And then these are like the extra questions that I'm just going to list here, but are not related to the topic. So I don't have time to really dive deeper into trying to answer them for you. Um, is there anything specific to pancreatic cancer? Yes, there is. Pancreatic cancer specific tips would be helpful. I agree. Please address the difficulty of eating for patients with a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. I would love to do that. In fact, I have done that. And I'm going to share some videos for those individuals. Um, and I'm going to do that before we get into the questions so that you don't have to watch the rest of the program if you don't want to. Um, and then what foods... Can I have when I have allergies to nuts, legumes, gluten, and pea protein? And then lastly, what about hemp seeds? I love these questions. They're great. We just don't have time to answer them today with our topic. So I mentioned, um, I have spoken about pancreatic cancer. There were a couple of programs that are in our YouTube channel that were dedicated 
um, specifically to pancreatic cancer and it was a collaboration. So, and I think that's vital with pancreatic cancer. You need a care team to surround you and to support you and caregivers at this time. So we had a Q and A with an oncology advanced practice nurse and myself, and we had a nice webinar and it's on our YouTube channel. So that link will bring you right to that video. And then we had an ask the experts with a medical, um, an oncologist, sorry, a physician who practices integrative medicine. She's not a medical oncologist. Um, and then we had an exercise specialist and then I myself, and we um, had really basically this comprehensive presentation about all of the things that are important for someone who's been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Now let's talk about hemp seeds. I think they're a great choice for everybody for lots of different reasons. And they're, and that's because they're nutrient dense. So when we incorporate them into our diet, we're gonna be adding some healthy fats, including omega-3s, some proteins, some fiber, some magnesium, some iron and B6, all great. And probably would be supportive of, a, of the type of way of eating that would help address fatigue. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So a great choice to add them. And I, I would, I would recommend them. They also are high in antioxidants and bioactive compounds that we call phenolic acids and carotenoids, as well as phytosterols. And those are fancy terms uh, to describe phytochemicals that have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. And phytosterol Rolls specifically, they may sound like something to you like, um, oh, sterol, like cholesterol. And yes, when we eat foods that have phytosteroids, phytosterols, and also phytosterol supplements or phytosterol are sometimes added to foods because we have to take a lot of them. That's been shown to lower LDL cholesterol. What do you know? Like effectively in, in, a, in an effective way too. Um, but specifically with prostate and breast cancer, phytosterols have been shown to inhibit proliferation, induce apoptosis, meaning to tell those cancer cells to die, and then to reduce invasiveness of cancer cells in culture, which is really interesting, right? So let's just wait and see if that happens in human form, but doesn't hurt to enjoy these hemp seeds for all of these reasons, right? Um, now, for the individual with multiple allergies, I think you are a great candidate to work one-on-one -on -one with a registered dietitian, whether it be an oncology dietitian like myself or one who is in general practice, because you need really a tailored plan to make sure that you're avoiding those things in, in a safe way, but then also to making up for what you're missing in the diet by incorporating a more variety of foods. Okay. And help you navigate the best choices. Your healthcare provider can refer you to one as well. Okay. So we're going back to those questions. We're going to start with which food supports energy and reduces fatigue, best foods to boost energy, to increase energy and increase stamina. So there's two uh, research studies that I'm aware of that I think are very helpful and compelling. And I'm like, it's about time, right? Because now they're starting to pay a little more attention and research to this highly prevalent problem. And maybe there are some ways we can leverage diet and nutrition to help ourselves. So one of them is, it, 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 this is the title of the study, Fatigue Reduction in Breast Cancer Survivors. And they, they took women from all different breast cancer types and they followed them for three months and they put them on something they call a fatigue reduction diet. We're gonna dive deeper into that. And what they found is that um, in the women that ate this fatigue reduction diet, they reported that their fatigue improved. So they used lots of different scales and surveys and ways to measure that. And there was an improvement after these three months. Um, what's really cool about this is that they can correlate the women who were on this fatigue reduction diet and improvement in symptoms, they can correlate that with blood markers because there are some compounds in the foods that we eat that can be measured in the blood. So they could see that, yes, the two were going hand in hand. They weren't just taking their women, the women's word for it, right? They were seeing that, oh, their markers went up because they're eating more of those foods. And then the fatigue is maybe coming down or is a little bit more manageable. Really exciting, right? And then there was another study, and this one's more recent. It was published, I think, within the last year or so. Um, and the title of that study is A Remote Whole Food Dietary Intervention to Reduce Fatigue and Improve Diet Quality in Lymphoma Survivors 
really exciting, right? Here's a whole nother cancer type that they're looking at a very similar diet and they're calling it this fatigue reduction diet. And it was similar in terms of the design. It was for 12 weeks or three months and they put them on this basically the same diet. It was almost the same research team. Um, and they, they gave remote counseling from a registered dietitian and they gave them a lot of different, like helpful tips. Like they taught them how to cook. They taught them like how to use those foods. Cause maybe they were unfamiliar with them. And really this is a feasibility study. So they wanted to see, is this doable for people? You know, can they actually achieve what we want them to do? And yes, the study proved that that could happen. Right. And the secondary findings were, were that the fatigue in the diffused large B cell lymphoma survivors, they, that was the lymphoma type. Um, they found that, yes, it did reduce their complaints of fatigue. So really exciting information here. And this is what we're going off of. Okay. So all of the information that follows are based on these two studies and that really um, interesting fatigue reduction diet, as we're calling it. So what is that fatigue reduction diet? I like to call it a high quality diet, right? So first and foremost, it's minimally processed and it's high in nutrients. So the foods that are consumed contain a lot of, a lot of different nutrients. So, and we're going to talk about that. So whole grains are on that list. Nuts and seeds are on that list. A variety of colorful vegetables, totally on that list. Fruit and especially citrus fruit and as well as also fish. Now, if you ask me, are these some of the health, healthiest foods we can eat? Yes, this is why we call it a high quality diet. And if you ask me, if you're looking for cancer protection, are these the foods to include on that list? Yes, absolutely. So it's like a win-win all around. And these are some of the foods we wanna focus on anyway, right? So let's get into some of the more specifics about it. Sometimes people ask me why, why a high quality diet? Like, what is it about this? Well, as it relates to cancer related fatigue, we don't know the cause of this chronic fatigue, right? That may last for years, but they do believe that inflammation is partly to blame. They do see that ele ele elevated levels of inflammatory markers are also correlated with fatigue. So that's what they think they need to address with the lifestyle. And we can address inflammation with diet. And so researchers are theorizing that it provides this high quality diet, this anti, um, this fatigue reducing diet provides all of the necessary components to help lower chronic inflammation. And also at the same time, modulate our immune system, right? Not boost the immune system, but just support it just to kind of keep it in check. Cause that's what we would want for someone who's been diagnosed with cancer. So, okay, I said I would go dive deeper into it. So let's do that. So this fatigue reduction diet, it's high in fiber. So if you've noticed on that list, there was fish on that list, but a lot of plant foods and a lot of minimally processed plant foods. So whole grains are a really good example. We could have whole grains in a more intact form, or we could have them very highly refined and processed. And so we know we want to keep that fiber in the less in the least processed way. Omega-3 fats, fish, nuts, and seeds were on that list. We know fish and fatty fish like salmon, mackerel, herring, sardines, anchovies, those are the highest in omega-3 fats, but also plant versions are chia seeds, flax seeds, walnuts, and hemp seeds, very high in omega-3s. There goes those hemp seeds again. I love it. And then antioxidants from including vitamin C, carotenoids, as well as vitamin E, those are our most our best known antioxidants in the diet. And we find them in colorful fruits and vegetables, especially citrus fruit, and also some of our seed oils. They're high in vitamin E. So there is something called this fatigue reduction diet. And it's, I'm going to share a resource to give you access to it if you want more information. And this is sort of the snapshot of it. So this is what they, in those research studies, this is what they were telling participants to try to do to get at least half of their grains in a day that were whole grain sources, to have five servings of vegetables per day, and to try to really get a variety of color, as you can see there, dark leafy green, dark green, right? And their leafy green vegetables, a yellow or an orange, a tomato, because that has a special type of carotenoid, and then two others, or even more of the above, 
then two servings of fruit, at least one of them from probably a citrus fruit because it's so high in vitamin C and then one or other fruit that you might enjoy. And then two servings a day from those omega-3 fats, which might be fatty fish or nuts and seeds or the oil version of them. So what I see when I look at that list, I see lots of fiber. I see lycopene in the tomato and I see carotenoids from the green to the yellow to the orange. I also see B vitamins from the whole grains and some of our vegetables. I also see vitamin C and E from our citrus fruit from some of our vegetables and then omega-3 fats from our fatty fish and those nuts and seeds. Now, someone asked a question, so I think here's a good opportunity to answer part of that question. Um, which ones are low in calories? If we're going to eat foods that help reduce fatigue and support our energy, but also are low calorie, these are it, right? So also these foods can help us if we're trying to manage our weight because they're relatively low in calorie. They're so full of fiber, so full of other vitamins and minerals, antioxidants, and they're full of water, right? Especially our fruits and vegetables, that there's not a lot of room for calories, which is really nice. So we can have a nice hearty portion and still um, help manage our weight. So a little bit more in terms of like specifics and examples. So whole grains, if you're looking at labels, we want at least three grams of fiber, if not more per serving. So great examples are oats or air pop popcorn, whole wheat crackers. Again, you wanna check labels, but there's also farro and quinoa and other whole intact grains that you might wanna consider. Vegetables, I mean, they're all great. I just listed some on the slide there as well as fruit, they're all really great sources. Those especially, uh, the first ones listed are especially high in vitamin C, and then our omega-3 fats that I mentioned earlier. Now we're gonna move on to the next question. So what proteins provide the most energy and what foods builds muscle? Really great questions. I wanna point out that extra protein does not give us energy or reduce fatigue, okay? Because that came up as a theme in a lot of the questions that were submitted. I'll say it again, extra protein will not give us energy or reduce fatigue. Eating enough protein is important, however, because we have a requirement for protein and this will help us to prevent a deficiency in protein because if we're protein deficient, then we might feel fatigued, right? I have more to this answer, so stay tuned. A protein deficiency can also impair our immune function, which would contribute to fatigue. However, based on survey after survey after survey, the majority of us in the United States, we exceed the minimum of recommendations for protein intake. And a protein deficiency is rare. It may happen globally, right? Where there's a lot, there might be food shortages or starvation, but not here in the States. We rarely see a protein deficiency. If you suspect that you're not eating enough protein, please consult with your healthcare provider because that needs to be evaluated further. As a dietitian, that is also something that I can help you explore more if that's a concern of yours. And so I, I do want to talk a little bit more about protein to give you a little bit more confidence and reassurance that hopefully you're eating enough. Protein is a nutrient and we, we need to eat it. And we also especially need to eat all of the essential amino acids for proper health and proper function, especially with our immune system. The essential amino acids need to be consumed. That's what we need to make sure. And there's nine of them out of 20. So we need to eat those nine, okay? And I'm, I'm betting most of you do. Again, if you need a little more help, I can help with that. Now, if we're looking to build muscle, we need to eat those essential amino acids, but that's not it. We also have to use the muscle, right? If, we need, if we're looking to build muscle, we absolutely can't rely on protein alone. It's a combination, right? So eating enough of those amino acids and also using muscle. So body strength exercises or resistance training, um, they're very important to building muscle mass. So let's talk a little bit more about this combination. A lot of people ask me for numbers. So if you're looking for the amount of protein you should be eating per day, we essentially prescribe that based on your weight. So we like to use kilograms. And so we would aim for about 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of your body weight. This is as long as you don't have an, a 
medical condition that would indicate you should restrict protein. So anyone with a kidney disease, we might want to double check that it's okay for you to eat this amount of protein. So this is like giving you a nice cushion here to make sure you're getting the protein that you need. This is a pretty good number, 1.2 grams. Now you might be wondering, like I weigh myself in pounds. So help me out here, Lori. <laughs> so I will. <laughs> so each kilogram is 2.2 pounds. And that's why some people like to report their weight in kilograms instead of pounds. So if if someone, for example, were to weigh 150 pounds, they would be 68 kilograms. Okay, so that's the number. And we're gonna take that 68 kilograms and multiply that by 1.2. And that's gonna give us the number of grams of protein that we need to eat throughout the day. So that number just so happens to be 80, which I'm gonna guess most of us are pretty close to doing. Now, the trick here is that you don't wanna eat all of that 80 grams at one meal. All right, so you're not gonna just save the 80 for dinner. We wanna spread it out throughout the day. So maybe it looks like 25, 30, 30, or which isn't quite that number, but we're close. Um, so you wanna spread it out. I would say a minimum of 25, maybe not much less than that, at a meal three or more times per day. The reason why that's important is because it gives our muscles the protein that it needs at one time. And that's what's been shown to help in the synthesis of muscle, or at least in retaining muscle, if we're under treatment or especially chemotherapy, or if we're in heavy weight training regimens, we might lose muscle. So to prevent the loss of that muscle, that 25 plus some a few times a day, if not more, it seems to be the goal for most. We want to primarily consume animal proteins for that number because they have the highest amount of the essential amino acids that we eat, okay? So that includes low-fat dairy, lean meat, fish, and eggs. Now, some of you who might be mostly plant-based or vegetarian, yes, you can eat all of the essential amino acids, but you have to you do have to do some work to make sure you're eating enough of them because some of the plant foods, even if they are a complete protein, they might not have all of the right amount of the essential amino acids. Just because they have them, they might not have enough that we're looking for in terms of reaching this goal. And that's again, where a dietitian can help. And then we're gonna aim for weight training at least two times per week, get the go ahead from your healthcare team. And that would be a great thing to also explore here at Cancer Wellness Center because we have a lot of services to help you with that. So again, eating enough protein throughout the day, I just wanna give you a glimpse of what that might look like. Breakfast might be some Greek yogurt with some chia seeds. I also added in some omega-3 fats there for you. <laughs> and that's gonna be very close to the goal. Um, lunch could be something like canned tuna, we have a side of quinoa and broccoli. You're going to reach your goal. Dinner, lentil soup with, I'm thinking the roasted chicken's kind of on the side. You see what I did there? But that's going to be sort, this is sort of plant-based and it's going to give you the amount of protein that we're looking for. If you're looking to build muscle, if you're looking to prevent the loss of muscle, if you're looking to make sure that you're eating enough protein to support your energy and reduce fatigue, this might be an important way of looking at your choices. Now, snacks can also be high protein and minimally processed. So a handful of almonds, edamame right out of the pod, really high protein choices here and nutrient dense besides. All right, we're moving on to the next question. How does limited sugar intake help reduce fatigue? I love this question. So it's a matter of how much. Okay, so if we're looking at our energy levels, it's how much, right? And a lot of times it's just the right amount, not overdoing it, not underdoing it. And that's the same case for sugar. So too much sugar is really what the issue is. And extra sugars in an overall diet, they reduce the quality of the diet, right? If we're eating a lot of highly sugary foods, then we're not eating a lot of the other stuff they want us to eat, right? So they sometimes replace that. Extra sugars in a lower quality diet may tip the scale in our body towards a more inflammatory kind of a state. Extra sugar foods replace high quality nutrients, right? So it's a matter of, there's a matter of a few things going on here. It's not the sugar directly, it's the how much and because we're losing out on the other stuff because we're eating too much of that, okay? So 
we do recommend in an overall high quality diet that we limit, we don't have to restrict them, but we limit. So think about like 90, 10 or 80, 20, you know, there's still room for these extra sugar foods, but just in the minority of the time. Okay. So sugary beverages, I would absolutely put on that list because they really are concentrated sources of sugar. So things like sweet teas or even sports drinks, um, of course, soda, some of our juices, some of our smoothies, they are extra, extra, extra sugar. So we just want to limit them. Uh, frozen dairy desserts also rate pretty highly in the American diet in terms of our sugar consumption. And then our sweet snacks. So donuts, cookies, brownies, even homemade ones, right? Like we know how much sugar we're putting in them. So we don't, again, have to limp, restrict them altogether. We just need to eat them in much smaller quantities. Will eating a lot of extra protein help reduce fatigue? And what about those keto breads? So I sort of talked about that protein and I'm going to go back to it just to summarize what the extra protein does not do for fatigue. It doesn't really help, right? So eating enough is what matters. I'm going to talk about that after I talk about keto, because anytime I have an opportunity to talk about keto, I'm going to take it. All right. So keto breads that have six grams of protein and hardly any fat. I'm so glad whoever asked this question asked it and then also put that in parentheses because that for me was very, I was very curious about that. What kind of a keto bread hardly has any fat because keto is all about the fat. Actually, did you know that? So I'm going to show you an image of a modified keto diet. So this is modified. This isn't even truly a keto diet. It's a version of it, but it's an easier to do version of it. So it's not strictly keto. So this is what it would look like. So in a mix of the macronutrients in a keto diet and a modified one, this would be 82% fat. So 82% of the calories you consume are coming from fat, right? So if a bread hardly has any fat, it's, it's probably not fair to call it a keto bread or taking advantage of that. Now, what I do want to mention about this, most of you probably know, keto diets, all the versions of the keto diets are pretty low if not very low in carbohydrates. So 6% of carbohydrates in a modified keto diet. In a standard healthy high quality diet, we're gonna go up to 45 to 65% of calories. So 6% is really low here, right? Really, really low on keto. But the other thing to point out is that keto diets are also low in protein, sort of, right? So only 12% of calories from protein in the modified version. The reason for that is that if you're eating so low carbohydrate that when you do eat some protein, if you eat extra of it, the body actually takes that protein and uses it the way it would use carbohydrates and it turns it into blood sugar because our body has a preference to use carbohydrates for its blood sugar production. So if you truly pursue a keto diet, you technically have to go lower in protein. And that's an important point and concept to get across to everybody. So it's not like Atkins. It's not like we're eating protein on a keto diet. We're eating actually pretty low protein. We're eating all fat, right? That's what, it, that's what we end up eating on a keto diet. So it's very high in fat. So about this keto bread, <laughs> I don't know that it's really technically keto. It sounds like it's a high protein bread, probably low carbohydrate and high protein. So what we're looking to do, right, if we're really looking to support um, our health and help in terms of maintaining muscle, we just need to eat enough protein and eat it in a way that I described earlier. Keto breads, in, in this example, I'm going to assume they lose an element, a very important element of the fatigue reduction diet. If you're paying attention, you're going to know what it is. If it's low carb, it might be low fiber. And remember, fiber was something that was standing out about this fatigue reduction diet. And we know fiber is important in reducing fatigue. We know this from research. So if we go keto, we're definitely going low fiber. We might want to take a fiber supplement if we're on a keto diet. I've worked with individuals on this. Um, but it's important to point out that that keto bread is, might not be helping in managing fatigue. Okay. Um, those following a ketogenic diet often report fatigue as a common side effect. So it's another thing to point out, and it could be the initial phases of it. When someone is drastically reducing carbohydrates, that is a side effect. We know they become fatigued or they could be fatigued from 
um, a lower calorie consumption. There could be a lot of reasons why someone might feel be feeling fatigued on a ketogenic diet. But I wanted to share that bit of information too. So what's the bottom line about this protein? Remember, and I think it's just, it's worth reiterating, extra protein hasn't been shown to reduce fatigue, right? So eating extra protein isn't necessarily gonna help us. We just wanna eat enough. We wanna eat enough protein. You can use that calculation I offered. And this can be an important way to make sure you're eating enough to prevent a deficiency, which a deficiency could then lead to fatigue and could lead to the loss of muscle and improper immune function. Okay, so it's all about that Goldilocks effect. Eat just eating enough, not too little, not too much. Next question. I thought this was a great one. Does eating dairy food make you feel tired? I've stopped the milk and my cereal. Thought that was interesting. So does dairy really zap our energy? Uh, maybe you've heard of this. Milk contains an amino acid, an amino acid called tryptophan. Yes, the tryptophan we eat in our turkey on Thanksgiving. And tryptophan, independently, has been shown to improve sleep and mood in the elderly. So tryptophan is a good thing, right? Now it's very high in milk. So uh, tryptophan helps produce serotonin and melatonin. So that's a good thing. Um, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that improves mood. It, it has a role in cognitive reasoning and memory. And melatonin, you may have heard of this. It's a hormone released in response to darkness, which makes us sleepy at night. So it, so if we're making melatonin all day long, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe it's making us sleepy. I, I couldn't find any definitive research or data that like looked at this to answer this question, but it stands to reason based on your experience that the milk made you tired, right? And if you cut it out or use the substitute, maybe like a non-dairy milk, because there's a lot of alternatives these days. If you use that for the nutrition, you know, and the does it make you tired? I would say just continue doing it. Are you missing anything by not having milk? Besides the fact that you might miss milk, you're not really missing anything. Um, and I'm happy to explore that more and give you some recommendations if that's what you're looking for. We're gonna move on to the next question. Um, and this is the last one. What if nothing works to reduce fatigue? I thought that was a really good question. Oh, I wish I had a better answer for that. Um, do keep in mind, that it's a lifestyle that they're looking at because what's the root cause, right? And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but think about the sleep habits. Think about exercise and movement as best as you can do, right? Anything is better than nothing. Think about what I presented in terms of the fatigue reduction diet and could you more closely align some of your choices with that? And then think about the mind-body practices. These modalities are beneficial in more ways than one. So if you haven't tried any of these or maybe one or two of them, maybe it's worth exploring um, if you're really willing. And I know it's probably not easy, um, but if you're really willing to try, you know, to really address this from all angles, I think it's important that you discuss what you're feeling with your healthcare team always and be an advocate and ask some questions, you know, what is causing my fatigue? Because it could be the anemia right? And is the anemia being managed? Is it pain that you're having? Is it a mood disorder like depression or anxiety? You know, and could that be treated? Um, could there be other things that you can do? Because knowing the cause is important, right? What can I do to have more energy? I think that's an important question because then you'll get some more specific answers and direction. Is exercise recommended? We know that this is probably the most helpful way to address fatigue is movement, believe it or not. It seems counterintuitive, right? But definitely there's there's movement exercise, there's movement, there's exercise, there's anything that is going to be helpful to reduce fatigue. Relax, relaxing activities also have been shown to be helpful. So, you know, maybe it's important to ask that question too. Can I do, is there something I can explore there? And then how much sleep should I be getting at night? I love that. Like, what a great question. Should I be getting seven, eight, nine hours? Or should I be getting, I'm only getting six. Is that enough? You know, and, and what if I'm sleeping during the day? You know, I think exploring that further because sleep is so vital for our health as well is important. And maybe there is some treatment or other modalities to consider for managing your sleep. Okay. So just wanted to also share some resources and tips. Um, the National Cancer Institute has some good information about 
cancer related fatigue. So if you're looking to have more of a um, comprehensive understanding, more so than what we just talked about today, this is a good website to visit and, and bring this to your oncologist or your care team. Um, the Ohio State University um, has a nice little post on their website and it's like a testimonial. So there's a video clip of one of the lymphoma patients that was in their study. So Ohio State, like they did the study there. And so it's a nice little blurb. It's like a two minute read and then a nice little video clip of this gentleman and his spouse and how they pursued this fatigue reduction diet and how it really made a difference for him. And then there is a PDF on the University of Mi Michigan's website. So this link will bring you right to it. And it's a PDF of the fatigue reduction diet. So I gave you a little image in one of the slides. If you want to see that more thoroughly, you get to have at it with that link. So I hope you do get to explore that. And I thought I would just share quickly, like, how do we add more vegetables to the diet? Because I get asked that a lot. Um, Add it to what you're already eating. Maybe you're making lasagna. Maybe you're making mac and cheese. Maybe you're making an omelet or a quesadilla. Could you just squeeze some veggies in there, right? A little bit goes a long way, especially for the whole family. Could you, if you're adding, if you're making a pizza or could, if you're making like a pasta sauce, could you add more vegetables in there? I bet you can. You can add them to soups. And I love frozen vegetables for this reason. They're technically processed, but they're not the highly processed ones we otherwise would be eating. They're usually just the vegetables and you can add them so easily right to soups as is without even thinking about it. And boom, you got more nutrition. Um, I wanted to also share ways to enjoy flax seeds. So I have a handful of recipes. One is a flax egg, one is a flaxseed granola bar, and one is a version of breadcrumbs using flax seeds and a lot of other spices and actually nutritional yeast. And I've never tried it, but seeing the recipe like inspired me and I wanna, I wanna try this one out. So a great way to add those omega-3 fats. Now our next Ask the Dietitian is scheduled for Friday, May 3rd, same time, same place. And um, we're going to talk about plant-based food choices because it seems to be ever popular. And I got a lot of questions about that. So you get to ask me any of your questions related to plant-based choices. And I hope today you learned a little bit more from me and that you'll um, also attend in the future. I'm going to stop my share there. And I want to thank everybody for attending and for staying the whole time, including you on Facebook. <laughs>